it is the pink elephant theory. If the guest wants a pink elephant, get them a pink elephant. If you can't find a pink elephant, get a horse, paint it pink, convince the guest that's an elephant. Do whatever it takes to ensure they're happy. That's it. Are they happy? And welcome back. I am Chris Adams. You're on the Pink Elephant. And um, I have a great show today. I have Carol Pinshevsky with us, an amazing writer. I mean, written for so many different publications, but then also a new author of a really cool book. I, I had the opportunity myself to go through it. It is Turning Your Fandom into Cash. And Carol, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Of course. So uh, one, I love the name, Turning Your Fandom into Cash. And it um, it, it's really talking about how do we, and, and please keep me honest here, but it's really saying, how do we take those things that we're passionate about and find a way to then turn that into something that is, is you know, can drive uh, revenue and, and turn it into something monetary um, for how we, how we live our lives? Is that a good assessment? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's pretty good summation. Uh, basically, when people think of business, they sometimes think it's kind of boring, I, I know I did, and I know that from my experience as a, a writer and copy editor of of business copy, and, and there's just some awful, awful verbiage. One day I'm going to start my own my own video series on just the worst business writing I've ever seen. And <clears throat> I mean, uh, it's stultifying and dull. and and then I see people doing what they love, and I think, well, you know, why shouldn't you turn your passion and what you do into how you earn your living? I mean, yeah. business doesn't have to be boring and, and doing what you love, it excites you. It gets you up in the morning. It, it makes you ready to face the new day rather than saying like, oh, I gotta go to work. You're like, oh, yay, I get to go to work. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. And I, I love that you're doing this. And it's true. I think anytime somebody goes to start a business, there's... I think you have this weird honeymoon period of the the creative side of, oh my God, I'm going to start something and I'm passionate about it and here's all the amazing things I'm going to do and everyone's going to fall in love with it and it's going to be overnight success. And then the reality of starting a business sets in and all the, the paperwork and all the crap you have to deal with and it kind of stifles the creativity, right? It, it takes away from the excitement that you had about it in the first place. Um, so I couldn't agree more. How do we, how do you take that passion, that creativity and turn it well, into, to that? I tried to make it easy to have people start a business. I, I gave step by step by step a little. Let guide. me tell you, step by step is an understatement. As I'm going through this, you literally gave the details, the nuts, the bolts. If you've had anyone that hasn't gotten this book, I highly encourage you, if you're going to start a business, I don't care what the business is to go get this book, uh, turning your phantom into cash, because it literally takes you, I mean, step by step on what you need to do, um, to actually get it from ideation to, to implementation. So kudos to you for actually putting that together. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe my next book will be turn your passion into cash because uh, people see the word fandom and they say like, Oh, it's not for me because I'm not a fan. But I've, I've had a lot of people tell me like, Oh, this works for any creative types or anybody wanting to start a small business. And, yeah. and, uh, but uh, the reason I chose turn your fandom into cash is because I am a passionate fan. And like all fans, we, we spend money on what we love. So I, I have been doing that <laughs> and and i and i walk into these dealers rooms you know ready to spend money and i see i see a whole lot of business being done if you go to new york comic-con you're seeing millions of dollars changing hands yeah. every day every day um and i i really do believe that the geek market has been completely underestimated um and well Hopefully it's being <laughs> estimated now, but um, I have some facts and figures for you, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, please. In 20, 2021, the video game industry was worth $60 billion. As of this week, the top 10 highest grossing films of all time, eight are science fiction or fantasy. And The Lion King is kind of sort of fantastical, but the, the other was Titanic. Um, in 2021, uh, comic book sales were $2 billion. And of that, 
one and a half billion was manga, which is um, tends to be Japanese, is also Korean and other Asian uh, series. Um, and then comic books are on Kickstarter. So, uh, so saying that comic books are worth two billion isn't really the full picture because in 2020, comic books are in 25 million on Kickstarter. And uh, the board game market, while completely not not completely geeky, it was worth 18.93 billion in 2022. That's amazing to me. I think it's the biggest market your audience isn't taking seriously enough. Yeah, and I'm what I'm curious. What do you think? Look, comic books have been around for for years and years, and as much as the world continues to go digital. Comic books is that one piece that that is, it's continuing to drive and stay true, and people aren't letting that go. What do you think is driving? What's the driving force behind that? Well, comic books tell tales that are kind of, um, I would guess you would call them epic, uh, but they have their own they have their own matter. Uh, yeah. Um, essentially if you have tales like, uh, King Arthur, they get retold again and again, but the stories are the same. And the, and so when you've got superheroes, you've got the same stories that you're just telling and retelling over and over again. I think it kind of speaks to myth and legend. Yeah. What is it? Um, I'm curious for, for you, what, what growing up were you just into comic books were your parents into it like what got you into this to become um so invested in this industry you know um there's a line in star wars said your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough um when i was uh i think i was 11 when my father gave me a copy of i robot by isaac asimov and and Prior to that, I was actually just a huge fan of uh, horror movies, Universal Monsters. Uh, I thought The Mummy was the most romantic movie I'd ever seen. I think it was 1932 or 1933. And, and I just, I loved Dracula and Frankenstein. I, I lived in Southern California for three years as a child, and they constantly played these creature features. And I just, I <laughs> fell in love even then. But, but my, my real... Uh, passion started when my dad gave me a copy of both iRobot and um, The Puppet Masters by Robert Heinlein. And wow. I just, I was immersed, deeply immersed in that world. And so back then, unfortunately, it was considered, you know, geeky in a, in a terrible way, as opposed to geeky in a fun way to, to really like right. science fiction and fantasy. And, and uh, you know, it was made terrible fun of, but I, I can't help what I love. And uh, uh, as, an, as a friend and interviewee of mine once said, being a fan is like being in love. And you just want to spend as much time as possible with these characters and this world that you are just wrapped up in. And uh, because of that, uh, that's why geeky people are really good at spending money on their passions, they kind of like to surround themselves with their totems. I live in New York City, so I'm very limited in what I can have. But I do over there have one of the very few items that I do collect. I, I still have my original 12 inch Darth Vader doll from 1978. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, it's crazy the value of, of this stuff. I mean, it's it's true investments. I mean, it's, it's like having real estate holdings at this point. I guess so. I guess so. But in some ways, it's just plastic. It's just more plastic. Uh, yeah. I met a collector who said, like, yeah, this is great, but my, my children will not appreciate this. So it, collections are very personal, extremely personal. So, yeah, but yeah. yes, um, you, can, uh, you can definitely fund a college education on on an old comic book collection. My father did not, unfortunately. His mother, my grandmother, who I loved very much, she tossed out my father's comic book collection when he went into the Navy. <laughs> oh, wow. Still love you, Grandma. <laughs> but he could have. But he could have. Because everybody's mother threw out the comic book collection. Yeah, of course. When he went into the Navy. <laughs> Which is why wow. these things have value. But yeah, um... Uh, there is definitely also a, 
a real market for luxury goods in the geek community. Uh, the people I know who have businesses and earn their living completely just through fandom, uh, they they have luxury markets. Wow. Like, like jewelry and clothing. And yeah. one, one person makes motorcycle jackets. That's crazy. And I, you know, the funny thing is I know when we look at a lot of our brand stuff, we do things in the hospitality industry where a lot of the major hotel groups. And when I tell you the comic cons and, and the cons that pop up all over the place has such an impact on the hospitality industry. When we talk about get the number of hotel guest rooms, um, citywide events now that are taking up multiple mini hotels of everybody going to these events, the amount of money spent within these hotels, just on food and beverage for people dining. It's crazy how this industry is gone beyond just impacting those that are fandoms, but people in other industries that are reaping the benefits on of, honestly of so many people that are wanting to be at these events across the U S and, and the globe, really. Right. I, I once wrote an article, I think it was 12 years ago, and I don't have the facts to hand, but I think the economic impact of San Diego Comic-Con on the city of San Diego was more millions than I had realized it could be. And yeah, people people travel uh, for their for conventions and their fandoms, and also just to be with other people who also enjoy and love the same things we do. It kind of it's easier to start a conversation with someone when you're there doing what you love because you have this shared experience and the same conversation that you can have like, Hey, what did you think of that Marvel movie? And yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think uh, conventions have create a really wonderful sense of community. I was literally the word that was about to come, come out of my mouth was it's, it's a community. It, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's individuals that are like-minded um, that you don't need to know them, but there's almost an instant connection um, that a, a comfort level around um, those that are attending that you're, you're probably not getting anywhere else other than in those type of environments. Yes. Yeah. Well, we have our you know local board game stores and we have the friends we make at conventions that we hang out with. And, and of course being online, you have your online communities. So, so, during the pandemic, it was hard not having that kind of convention experience, but we, we managed, <laughs> we managed, but, um, uh, Wait, actually I'm curious during the pandemic, when obviously no one was able to go out, you couldn't travel, we couldn't have these, these massive events. What was the, the community doing, um, online digitally to try and fill that void? What was right. there, were there almost online conventions happening? Yes, actually, I did attend online conventions, um, which were actually were wonderful because you could get guests that you couldn't normally get. Um, a woman I know, uh, she runs Chris McLennan. She runs Phoenix Fear Fest, I think it's called. Um, she had, I think, the granddaughter of somebody, oh, goodness, um, these amazing writers. And, and she was able to get guests that she couldn't get because they could just, they didn't have to travel. They could just appear at home in their pajamas <laughs> as many, <laughs> as many people do. <laughs> and, uh, and so the pandemic was also good for learning. A lot of, a lot of universities opened up classes and free classes for people um, in, in art and video game design. So the pandemic in some ways was very good for the community. Sad that we couldn't actually physically get together, but also, you know, I managed to attend a convention that normally I have to fly to England for. And yeah. see, yeah, I mean, save you money. find the positive, the positive wherever you can. Right. Yeah. And also, you know, fewer carbon emissions. So yeah. <laughs> very true. Are you seeing in this, within this world, um, the next generation and generations to come, are you seeing this as, as continuing to grow with the next generations? Or do you think this is something that um, you're, you know, like many industries, you're struggling to find ways to make sure the next generation embraces it, understands it, and, and continues to drive and cultivate it? Well, um, it's funny you should ask that. Um, the industry is def definitely evolving and it will not look like 
the superhero world of the last two decades uh, for two reasons. One, uh, in the dominant film genre from the 1940s to the 1960s were Westerns, were Westerns. And, and that took about 25 years. Um, comic book movies have really been on the radar for 15 years, maybe, well, longer than that in some cases because the original, uh, the first X-Men movie came out in 2001, but uh, I guess it really took hold about 15 years ago. So like all genres, it will kind of die down. Yes, something, yeah, something else will replace it. So I'm, I believe that although we are the dominant culture right now, we've definitely won the film industry. I don't know if it's going to be sustained in that same way. Uh, but at least the good news is people recognize what comic books are and, and geek culture in general is. But also the other thing that's changing is um, a lot of a lot of the original superheroes and, and science fiction books of the past, they all had straight white men as their protagonists, and and now that has evolved. And so, people won't just be looking for straight white men as their heroes and their main characters. I think that's part of the reason manga has become so popular. We're we're no longer, you know, just this white monoculture in America. You know, people are every race, every religion, multiple genders. So that's why I think manga is becoming more popular and anime. I mean, not, not that it wasn't popular. I mean, I was watching anime back when it was called Japanimation. Wow. Like that was a long time ago. And so, uh, but it's definitely more popular now than it's ever been. I think that will continue to grab a uh, hold of the public imagination. Yeah, like you were just saying, I think that that the evolution of um, who who are the heroes, um, who it it invites um, a bigger demographic of people that can now identify, um, relate to, um, see themselves in, um, and and so it's very it's interesting and cool to see that even something that is as classic as comic books that you um, is is evolving at a rate that stays aligned with where we are as a society um, and you're seeing I mean look I can't imagine that 15 20 years ago I see the, the comic cons and everything else that are happening where you have every star every major a-lister that's in these movies that is showing up to comic con to be a part of it to shake hands to simply say thank you. I mean, that has to speak to the impact that it has on on the, the community as a whole, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I like to think of it as the other way around, the impact that we are having on these actors who, prior to the fact that they were like million dollar money makers, uh, a lot of actors and writers and directors would say, oh, I'd never sully my hands with something like that. I would never... I'm not interested in the science fiction. Uh, people who, there are writers who say, oh no, my work isn't science fiction, never. <laughs> like, like, uh, Margaret Atwood said that once about <laughs> one of her books, about one of her books and The Handmaid's Tale is pure science fiction. Pure science fiction. Uh -oh. Well, sorry, no, not yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, fair enough. Anymore. At the time. <laughs> At the time. I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, so um, I think that uh, that people are responding to us as a cultural movement rather than we are, you know, we are enjoying these actors. I think they're enjoying us. <laughs> oh, I couldn't agree more. And that's that's essentially what the way I meant it and, and the way I framed it up was that the impact that the, the fandom that community has had is now forcing and, and I don't forcing is not the right word. It, it's um, it's led the actors in that community to realize the importance and how they sh they need to be a part of it. And now they want to be a part of it. They you know, yes. I, I was watching someone the other day that talk about how much they enjoy and look forward to be able to be a part of it. And so it's uh -huh. uh, interesting. It's just a shift in the dynamic um, of what's happened there. 
Yes, um, the power is definitely with the fans in a lot of ways, not completely in every way, but um, uh, the beginning of this year, there was a movie called uh, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Uh, it was, it almost, there was almost a fan campaign against it, which really would have hurt the film's bottom line because prior to that, at the beginning of this year, um, uh, it's not Activision, sorry, um, Hasbro, sorry, Hasbro that owns Wizards of the Coast that created Dungeons and Dragons. They said that they were going to be changing their license, the open gaming license. Prior to this change, the, the current open gaming license says you can create Dungeons and Dragons add-ons. You can create uh, characters and spells that complement the game and, and sell them. And after, and um, I think in order to kind of maintain their intellectual property, uh, Hasbro said like, oh, we are, we are actually going to charge every person to uh, a licensing fee, which is in their right. However, most of these creators just make a few dollars and they spend a lot of time and effort into this. And so when, uh, Hasbro said that they would update their open gaming license to version 1.1. Um, a lot of fans just quit. Um, what is it called? Uh, some Dungeons and Dragons online. Uh, what is it called? Dungeons and Dragons D and D Beyond. Uh, and Hasbro measures their worth on D and D Beyond. Oh, wow. How much money they bring in. So um, fans really do have a lot of power. They after so after after a fan campaign saying like, oh, we're going to be quitting this online platform. We are not going to be seeing this movie. Uh, Hasbro rolled it back. Well, it's a interesting and when we talk about the financial side to all this and the business aspect, right. um, you know, it's been very open the fact that uh, movies aren't the same. People aren't going out to theaters like they used to. You have sh uh, streaming services that have really taken a bulk of that, which now means that uh, the studios don't make the same kind of money they used to make, which then rolls over to the actors. Um, do they really make what they make? And the only movies that have sustained and continue to increase in attendance and people actually getting out of their house, going to a theater and sitting down, um, ordering popcorn like we used to and enjoying in that space is this industry. And I, I think when you look at the science fiction, um, the impact that it's had on that, that industry, it's no doubt that these, the studio heads and these actors and actresses have flocked to the comic cons of the world because they realize this is at, at this moment, if you're talking about the blockbuster, it's where their bread is buttered. Um, they're the, you are the fans that are continuing to show up support and, and keep it, keep it growing. Right. Right. But um, that's kind of a double edged sword as well, because although uh, there are these high budget movies being made that take in, you know, $2 billion, uh, it's kind of cut out the mid-range movie and the mm -hmm. low-budget movie. I mean, well, there will always be low-budget, but some one of my favorite films when I was y younger. Oh goodness, I've forgotten the name. Um, uh, Dark Star, Dark Star, um, almost a no-budget movie. I mean, the the alien creature was pretty much a beach ball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, 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 but that was uh, written by the same person who wrote Alien, which was this massive blockbuster. John Carpenter, John Carpenter. Yes, John, thank you. No, but Dan O'Bannon was the writer. Dan O'Bannon was the writer. But anyway, um, we don't, it's cheesy and, and ridiculous, and I loved every second of it. And we don't get these movies anymore. We only get the biggest of the biggest budget films. And that well, makes the sad. middle of the road. Yeah. Do you yeah. think the middle of the road that the, the budgets might be, is that where our streaming, the Netflix and the Hulus of the world will come in and start creating and developing kind of that mid range where it's not the, the blockbuster budget, but still gives you additional um, content. Yeah. Good point. Because, um, and thank you for that. Uh, because uh, definitely viewership is has shifted towards streaming services. 
Uh, I don't have the facts in front of me, but I know I enjoy the story development that a TV show takes. Uh, you have to, you know, you, when you go to a movie, you invest two hours, maybe two and a half. And you sit and you have one story told, but with television, you can have multiple stories told, interwoven, and yeah. it just, it makes it a lot more fun and enjoyable, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think you might see um, almost the layers um, in that, in, you know, the sci-fi industry of the big blockbuster. And then as it rolls into streaming services, which now have, you know, really great budgets for a lot of these of what they're producing um, all the way down into your, your a traditional, you know, low budget, the, the cheesy stuff that you still fall in love with uh, for whatever reason that you, you're obsessed with. Right? I, have to, I, I hate to admit it. I hate to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> I think actually the reason I like these old cheesy movies is because they are not made brilliantly. And that way we can kind of fill in the gaps in our head and create our own stories about it. Like, oh, what? Well, how would it have been if if the alien were actually not a beach ball? <laughs> but actually, no, no, that was the delight of the film. I will never take away the beach ball, <laughs> but... <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that um, fandom is quite interactive. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people write fan fiction, read fan fiction. We, we create our own t-shirts. We create our own little toys and, and gadgets because we just like having this conversation with the, the people and the places that we enjoy. Um, yeah. the, the, but the big problem with that is, uh, everything we love is someone else's intellectual property. And, and I go into this in my book, uh, you know, there have been lawsuits against fans and there are things that you can and cannot do when you are working with someone else's intellectual property. You know, it's a perfect segue into really, let's take the, the last few minutes here. I want to talk about your book. And, um, you know, in the beginning we said, yes, it is the, the most amazing detailed step-by-step -step guide of, of how to launch this, um, if you're going to, but as you, as you were writing that, um, I have to imagine that there was, a, there was a personal piece. You wrote it for a reason. It was something you had dealt with, encountered, or you saw someone, individuals you were close with that dealt with these things. And you said, I've, this is, this was your answer. This was your open letter on, uh, back to assist someone else that potentially is, is dealing with that. Can you speak to that just a little bit of what, what happened or, and it, you know, you can keep it vague, but what happened that said, I've, I've got to get this information out for someone else. I don't have to be too vague. I can be somewhat specific. I attended a convention um, in New York City, and pretty much everything I saw for sale was uh, a duplicate of a, of a DVD. It was a photocopied version of something else. It was a toy that was clearly off-brand. And it wasn't just one or two people. It was pretty much the entire convention was this kind of off license experience. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. And I looked around and I was horrified and I just, I know that one lawsuit could just shut this entire thing down. And I don't want that to happen. I interviewed people and they told me about their experiences selling their work on Etsy and, and, People love what they make, absolutely, positively love what these people make. I do. I know I do. And they get takedown notices. And one person, she uh, she sold um, uh, dresses and she sold a Wonder Woman dress or a Batman dress. And then she got a takedown notice on Etsy. And... And I actually own the Batman dress, <laughs> but but then she she changed the name to like Dark Avenger dress, and then she didn't get a single takedown notice after that. That's something we have. It's called fan signaling. Of course, every corporation knows about fan signaling and and can take it down, but take down an item. But yeah, um, I I saw just a whole lot of IP infringement, and I'm just terrified that what I love could be taken away. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it's, um, you know, I love the fact that you, you oh, were able oh, to take way. some, 
But the um the uh the convention that um had done all of that infringing that was many years ago and they have since stopped. <laughs> I love the fact that you took something that you saw um, as a potential issue for something that you love. And you, instead of uh, sitting back and saying, oh my God, this is horrible. I hate to see this. I hope it doesn't happen. You took action and you said, you know what? I'm going to produce and create something that that will hopefully help uh, to ensure this doesn't happen moving forward. And um, the fact that you did that, a lot, of, a lot of people talk about things. A lot of people have great ideas and, oh my God, you know, this is, I wish I, I should do this or I wish that was out there. You took that idea and you actually put pen to paper and you created something that um, is going to help a lot of people. And so I commend you for not just thinking about it or talking about it, but actually doing something about it. So congratulations to you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. But um, of course, it was nothing without my stellar interviewees, uh, especially the lawyers who pretty much laid out what is and isn't allowable in terms of intellectual property. But then I also I also found somebody who got an IP license with no experience. And I have that in my book too, so his application for an IP license. And they're either um, a $2 million or a $2 million or a $2 million pound business now. I'm not sure, was it dollars or pounds? But yeah, they- Either they way, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they started with an idea and they wrote, they wrote a, the application that they thought someone would want to read. So that's how they started. And I have their license in my book. So if somebody wants to apply for an IP license, you can do that. Just follow this guide. That's, but, that's amazing. So but if some someone IP wants, yeah, go ahead. Some IP licensors want to see experience which is why I recommend sure. you start with a smaller, uh, a smaller property. You're not going to start with star Wars. Yeah. Good. Uh, start, start small, work your way up, right? Baby yeah. steps. Yeah. Uh -huh. If, if someone wanted to, um, as, as we close this out, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, if they were looking for support, if they just needed to get access to your book, um, follow your journey in this process, what is the best way that somebody that's listening right now or watching that they can um, grab hold of this and you can, you can help through your book, even just coach them uh, through this process. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, my book is called turn, not turning, turn your fandom into cash. Uh, my name is Carol Pinchewski. You can get a free sample chapter of my book at carolpinchewski.com. That's Carol, C-A-R-O-L, Pinchewski, pin like the needle, chef like the cook, sky like the thing above you. I also have a Substax, uh, carolpinchewski.substack.com. Uh, I send out a newsletter every week, keeping people abreast of what's happening in geek, geek culture, as well as uh, my new segment, Tales from the Booth, explain, uh, interviewing people who sell their goods at crafts fairs and, and conventions and other geeky markets and what they have learned. Uh, and one person uh, said that diversifying what he sells and selling useful items rather than just artwork, like, well, he sells a mug, he sells a tumbler, he sells, uh, a, and his new line is skateboards. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, for anyone that is watching or listening right now, um, Carol has created something fabulous. Again, her book, Turn Your Fandom Into Cash. Um, she has a lot going on. I think if nothing else, jump on, make sure you're getting this newsletter that's coming out, that's keeping you abreast of everything that's happening in this amazing industry that's continuing to drive our culture. Um, and it is so, it was so great having you on. I can't thank you enough for letting everyone get a little bit of a glimpse and insight into this world um, that everyone loves. And, and I don't think many of us know the details and the ins and outs of what goes in behind the scenes in this industry. Um, but I, I tell you, we, we come out in droves as we're all fans of um, these, these obviously the big blockbuster hits that continue to just do amazingly well at the theaters. And we thank, we thank you so much for individuals like yourself that are helping continuing to promote, um, but also educate along the way. So Carol, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. May I have one last thing to say? Please, um, please. Uh, their United Airlines in 2018 had a campaign to 
to get people going to the Olympics on their airline, and they used a superhero campaign by by pulling out, uh, you know, like oh, this is what the superhero does, but this is what the superheroic person who works for the airline does, you know, juggles luggage and things, and. Um, I think that although that was a really cute campaign, it, they really didn't take it far enough. Uh, if they really, really wanted to speak to the geek market, they would have had their own comic book. And I think I could just come up with 20 million ideas. So um, reach out to me if you want to uh, geek up your campaign. And, I love and it. Acquire the, the fandom that has millions of people in it millions i mean it's such a market that is it's it's continuing uh to grow uh, i don't want to say it's untapped but there is so much market there and so many additional things that could be done uh to continue to to grow and cultivate uh this uh, this amazing world right Yes. Well, thank you again. Chris Adams here with you on the Pink Elephant. You can find me at uh, Instagram, Chris Adams uh, underscore EAG, uh, Ellis Adams Official, or our website, ellisadamsroot.com. Carol Pinchewski, we can't thank you enough for joining us today. And uh, everyone, we look forward to seeing you next week.